Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming today to hear David Medine talk about his work on the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, also called the PCLOB, which may be one of my favorite government acronyms ever. Every time I say it, I laugh. Um, he was appointed by the president to be chairman of the PCLOB, which is an independent agency within the executive branch of the United States government, and it is charged with advising the president and other executive branch officials on privacy and civil liberties issues associated with development and implementation of laws, regulations, and policies within the executive branch. Um, Mr. Medina is an expert in banking law and financial services regulation, and he comes to the P-Club from a time at the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. He spent 10 years at the law firm of Wilmer Hale and 11 years as associate director for financial practices at the Federal Trade Commission. Today he's going to talk about the P-Club's work, um, its recent report, on the uh, revelations that the United States government had been collecting calling records on uh, U.S. persons' cell, uh, cell phone and telephone usage under Section 215 of the Patriot Act, and about the uh, PCLOB's upcoming report on the U.S. government use of the FISA Amendments Act, Section 702, uh, which is a law that allows warrantlessly targeting non-U.S. persons reasonably believed to be overseas and collecting their communications, a practice which we've learned has a lot of implications and effects on American privacy since American communications are incidentally collected as, as part of this. And um, in a couple of months, the P-Club will be issuing a report on this Section 702. And the report is going to be really essential to figuring out whether these particular bulk collection authorities are consistent with what it means to be a democracy in modern times and consistent with what a free and open internet looks like. The report for Section 702 is going to answer questions or try to answer questions like how many communications collected under this authority belong to American citizens? What is the national security value of authorizing warrantless surveillance on regular people who just happen to not be US citizens, as opposed to under the traditional foreign intelligence surveillance approach where you could only get surveillance authorized for people who are foreign powers or agents of foreign powers. Do the intelligence agencies delete American, all American information, um, or do they keep things like metadata, address books, contact lists, because they don't believe that they need to get rid of that stuff because it's not protected by the Fourth Amendment? How many times has information collected under Section 702 been disclosed to law enforcement authorities like the FBI, the DEA, the IRS, or other agencies? Um, these are really important questions, but they are only a fraction of the important questions that our society and that the P-Club are going to have to answer in the months and years to come. We've learned that there is so much other bulk collection going on, phone calls, emails, address books, buddies lists, text messages, cell phone location data, and that this collection, whether it's happening inside the United States or outside the United States, is affecting American privacy. We've also learned that the NSA and GCHQ, the British spy agency, have been deeply involved in efforts that undermine internet security overall, whether it's convincing companies to put back doors in or collecting encryption keys, spoofing company communications, or even doing targeted hacking on particular, against particular people. So uh, Dave, we, I would like you to join me in welcoming David Medine today, and uh, he'll talk for a while about the P-Club's work, and then we'll be able to ask him some questions. David, thank you. Um, thanks, Jennifer, and thanks for coming out um, today. I, uh, I guess I'll start with a disclaimer, um, which is that my views today don't necessarily represent the views of P-Club. Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board or other members, um, they'll, they'll be my own views. Um, uh, I actually got a call in September of 2011 from the White House asking if I'd be interested in being nominated for chairman of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. And my first reaction was, what's that? Uh, and so I uh, investigated it and found that um, after 9-11, the 9-11 Commission was created to find out what went wrong and what we could do better to prevent a terrorist attack in the future. Uh, and 
after several hundred pages of talking about how we can improve intelligence collection and sharing of information between intelligence agencies and connecting the dots better, uh, the 9-11 Commission said, now, uh, before we go too far down that path, we should recognize that uh, integral to the values of the United States are privacy and civil liberties, um, and that it's important uh, that we balance those concerns with national security concerns, and that we can do that and be effective in both, and if we sacrifice one, uh, we lose on the other. And so that, was, that recommendation ultimately led um, President George W. Bush to create a advisory board in the White House that was later replaced by Congress by a White House Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board uh, that was ultimately felt to be insufficiently independent. And so Congress abolished that and created essentially Privacy and Civil Liberties Board Oversight Board 3.0, uh, which is what we currently are, uh, which is an independent agency in the executive branch. Uh, we have five board members um, who are um, all uh, nominated by the President and confirmed by the Senate. Uh, we serve staggered six-year terms. We're a permanent um, organization. Um, again, bipartisan, no more than three members can be of any political party. Um, <coughs> and our, um, we have two main missions. One is to conduct oversight of existing counterterrorism programs um, to evaluate them as to whether they strike the right balance between privacy and civil liberties and national security, uh, and also to consider whether they're operating consistent with law. Um, we also have an advice function uh, which is that as the uh, intelligence community develops new programs, uh, new laws, and new regulations, uh, that the board can come in and provide advice as to how to strike the right balance with those programs. Uh, in the um, private sector, that's sometimes called privacy by design, uh, where you build in privacy protection as you're developing a product rather than try to retrofit it. Uh, we're trying to apply that same approach to government and, uh, collection information collection programs, and we've actually already begun to do that and, and have agencies have asked us to come in and brainstorm about new programs and how they can protect privacy and civil liberties while still being effective um, on counterterrorism. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one of the important uh, aspects of our board is that we be able to have full access um, to information so that we can evaluate programs. Um, and um, we do that in a number of ways. One is that all board members and all of our staff have to have the highest level security clearances um, so we can have full access to all government programs, no matter how sensitive um, or secret they may be. Um, on the federal side, uh, federal government side, um, our board is entitled, again, to access whatever we want and to talk to whoever we want to. And our statute says that if we go to an agency and the lower level staff person says, I'm not going to provide you the information, we have the authority to go to the head of the agency and that they will direct that staff person under law to cooperate with us. Uh, fortunately, we have not found that necessary so far. We've received tremendous cooperation from the executive branch uh, in accessing uh, classified court opinions, classified documents, getting briefings by all the relevant agencies, um, and even in the most highly sensitive government <coughs> programs. And so that has not been an issue to date, but, but that's an important part of doing our job effectively um, is that we have access to that information. Um, on the private sector side, um, it, it may not be often the case that we'll need to see private sector information because our focus is on federal counterterrorism programs but to the extent that there might be suppliers of databases or other information um, to the federal government. Um, we have the authority to, if we don't get cooperation, is to go to the Attorney General of the United States and ask that a subpoena be issued on our behalf to a private sector entity to get information. Uh, the Attorney General can either agree to issue the subpoena or explain the reasons why a subpoena uh, is not being issued. Um, to date, we've received, again, tremendous cooperation from private sector firms who've interacted with the government on the 215 and 702 programs, since we haven't felt it necessary um, to issue the subpoenas, or ask that subpoenas be issued on our behalf. I'm, I'm not sure if we ever will, but it's certainly an authority that makes it, makes sure we get access to all the information so we can see the full picture um, in evaluating intelligence programs. Our job, uh, um, we have no authority. Um, we can't make anybody do anything. Um, uh, our job is to advise the President and Congress and the American public um, about our views about how to strike the right balance in intelligence programs between uh, national security and privacy and civil liberties. Um, uh, the uh, first, uh, just to give, uh, uh, my, sort of pick up on my history, after getting the call from the White House, I was finally nominated in December of 2011, uh, and Congress, the Senate took 510 days to confirm me uh, as chairman. Um, that was on the downside. On the upside, I took office four days before the Snowden leak. 
Um, and so it, it turned out to be a much more interesting job than I ever imagined. Um, so my first week on the job, uh, uh, Thursday of the first week, the uh, Guardian published the first unauthorized disclosures from Snowden. And we had to decide, is this agency, with, which at that point had no email system, no website, no permanent staff, and barely an office, uh, so what we're going to do. And what we decided to do is uh, request a briefing uh, from the Attorney General and the Director of National Intelligence on these two programs, the 215 and 702. I didn't even have a security clearance at that point. That was on Friday. Uh, by Monday, I had a temporary security clearance. And Tuesday, we had our briefing on the operations of the two programs. Uh, and then the following week, we met with the President of the United States in the Situation Room at the White House to discuss surveillance issues and these programs. And so it was a very exciting um, start to my tenure uh, in the job. Uh, at that time, we were asked by members of Congress and the President to conduct a study of the 215 and 702 programs that Jennifer mentioned. Um, and that's pretty much we, what we've been doing since then. Um, over the summer uh, and fall, we studied both programs. And then I decided just we didn't have the staffing to do a report on both in a timely manner. So we decided to do the 215 report first, along with recommendations for reforms to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Um, and then turn to the um, 702 report, which we've done. Um, on the, um, just to talk a little bit about the 215 report, and the 215 program, um, as you may know, is the telephony metadata program, where information is collected uh, by NSA uh, from telephone companies about the phone numbers, dialing, dialing the phone number, receiving the call, the time of day, length of the call, uh, but not the contents of the call. Um, and not the names of either the caller or the recipient of the call. Uh, again, hence metadata. It's data about the call, but not the information about the call itself. Uh, and um, we, in order to study the program, we, we had briefings with the uh, relevant agencies that are participants in it. We actually went out to NSA and saw a demonstration of how the program operates, um, received classified information, including the opinions of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, uh, uh, which had approved the program and, and had reapproved it on a, on a number of occasions. Uh, we held uh, our, our goal is to be as transparent as possible, so we held two public events. We had a workshop over the summer and a hearing uh, in the fall to um, hear testimony from experts, academics, technologists, government officials um, to get input on how these programs operated. One of the interesting uh, uh, witnesses at our hearing, uh, which is an issue we hadn't expected to be as, as predominant as has been, is a former judge from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court um, who talked about how judges go about uh, approving these programs. And as, as you may know, only the government appears before the court. Um, so the court doesn't hear the other side uh, of whether the programs are constitutional or legal. And the judge said, um, we judges are very good about deciding essentially what are equivalent of search warrants, where the government's making a request about a particular person who's alleged to have engaged in particular activity. Uh, but the judges are not as, as good on their own in deciding how to approve programs, which is almost like an administrative function. And so the, so the judge testified to us that it would be very useful to have an outside person come in uh, and make arguments so that the judge can really hear both sides. You know, you read the briefs on one side, it all sounds very persuasive. Uh, but then if you read the other side's briefs, they sound pretty persuasive too. And that's the judge, judge's job is to sort through all that. But if you only hear one side brief, you don't really get to hear all the counter arguments. Um, and so that was something that was enlightening to us and, and, and um, I think informed a lot of our approach to these issues. Um, another aspect of our board that uh, is critical is that we be independent. Um, uh, as a, again, the prior version of our board was criticized for being not sufficiently uh, independent. Um, and um, we have a, a very clear understanding um, from the White House that they will not review the substance of our recommendations or our conclusions. Uh, um, before we make them, that the, uh, oftentimes federal agencies have to go through the Office of Management and Budget or the White House um, to have their reports or testimony approved. We don't. Our, our five board members vote, and, and that's the way it is. And I think that's critical to being an independent voice. And as, as, you, as you ultimately see from our 215 recommendations, we did not agree entirely with the White House. And, and I think that that was a demonstration of our uh, independence. Um, and, uh, one of the things um, that you may have also observed, we issued our 215 report, uh, which I'll describe a little bit, uh, in January, on January 23rd. Um, and the President of the United States gave a speech the week before on NSA reform. And I think some legitimate questions came, which is, well, why did you wait till after the President gave a speech 
so didn't you want to inform the president as part of your board role, then didn't really come after the fact. We were operating again with, with sort of two staffers uh, and, and what ultimately turned out to be a 235 page report, struggling to get it out as early as we could, which ended up being January 23rd. But when we learned that the president was going to be addressing this issue earlier than that, uh, we went to the White House and said we would like to share drafts of our report with you, uh, particularly the key sections that had analysis and recommendations on legal issues and, and privacy issues. And the White House said we'd be delighted to review that and, and, and t uh, consider that. And then after we did that, a couple days later, we met with the President and the Vice President and senior White House staff uh, in the White House to discuss our report. The President had clearly read our report. Uh, and ultimately, if you compare our report with the speech that he gave shortly thereafter, he actually followed a number of our recommendations. Uh, you know, he followed our recommendations very closely on reform of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court and in large part um, on the 215 program where he recommended some immediate changes and then some subsequent changes which again were similar to what we had recommended as well. And they, but he did not uh, uh, follow our advice entirely but I think the substantial parts of it were followed and the White House has, has subsequently said that. Um, so turning to the 215 report to tell you what we did conclude um, which is that uh, a majority of the board concluded that the program was inconsistent with the statute um, and on numerous grounds um, that it had uh, raised serious constitutional and uh, privacy concerns and had not demonstrated sufficient effectiveness uh, to continue. Um, and so based on those legal constitutional and policy concerns, uh, the board recommended that the program be ceased uh, and that not just replaced by another statute, but that we ra it raised significant privacy concerns and should not go forward. Um, and we also felt that the information that the government was collecting pursuant to this program could be obtained through other sources um, without collecting bulk data on uh, substantial numbers of phone calls. That is, the information could be obtained through search warrants, grand jury subpoenas, and national security letters. And that, in fact, under the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, it was actually illegal to, to obtain telephone records because phone companies aren't authorized to provide records under the 215 program. Um, and so, <laughs> again, the majority of the board felt that the program um, it, was, it was a good faith effort to try to put the program under a legal auspices, um, but it didn't really work to try to shoehorn it into a statute that wasn't really designed to support that kind of activity. And then even if it was, we don't think on privacy and civil liberties grounds that the program um, should continue. Um, that's the majority of the board. The three, it, was, it was a three versus two. The two dissenting members um, chose to give more deference to the government's interpretation of the statute and the court's interpretation of the statute um, and felt that the program um, should, could, in big terms, consider it continue as is. Um, there was, however, a, a unanimous view that even if the program continued, um, there should be some immediate privacy protections added to the program. Um, under the current program, information can be collect, collected for five years. Um, we all agreed that it should be collected for no more than three years. Um, and then there are hops, and I don't know if you're familiar with the way the program operates, but if you find out a phone number, you can find out who that phone number called, and then who all those people called, and then who all those people called, and you can imagine that the numbers grow substantially, um, and, and uh, sometimes the government would do up to three hops, which ends up collecting thousands and thousands of phone records. Um, our, we unanimously felt that, that in the interim period for, for the majority and then permanently for the minority, um, that there should be no more than two hops uh, uh, collected. Um, uh, because beyond that, uh, the, the linkage um, was not really very plausible. Um, <coughs> we also recommended that there be some reporting back to the court, uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, about the criteria, the actual selections, so that the court could oversee that the government was selecting phone numbers that had some legitimate connection to an uh, investigation. Um, in terms of the operation of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, as I mentioned, I, um, we viewed uh, it as important that there be other voices before that court on uh, issues of novel technological changes or not novel legal issues. And so we recommended that there be a special advocate, um, which are private attorneys uh, who are selected by the court to appear before the court on cases involving, again, ch uh, challenging new issues. Uh, and that advocate, his job is not to oppose everything the government advocate, uh, proposes to the court, but instead to apply the judgment a lawyer would apply in any case and say, is, uh, do we think there's a legal basis for the government's request and a constitutional basis? If we don't, we will argue vigorously before the court to oppose those. Um, but if we think that the government's position is legitimate, then that's fine, and we won't oppose it. 
Sure. Um, we are. They, the uh, president um, um, uh, picked a uh, presidential review group uh, with a limited term, I think it was about 90 days, um, to look at a wide range of uh, issues relating to foreign intelligence. And, and, and part of the review group uh, task was to look at the 215 program as well. Uh, and there they came up with a recommendation um, to eliminate bulk collection of information, which was similar to our recommendation. Um, but they recommended it as an alternative, either keep the information with providers, um, which is the telephone companies, which we, uh, our majority supports. But they also recommended the possibility of a third party outside the government holding that information, which we unanimously oppose. Uh, and our view is taking the massive amount of the information from the government and putting it into a private entity's hands doesn't seem to solve many problems. In fact, creates more problems because what is the legal status of that entity? Are they subject to the Freedom of Information Act? What security procedures do they have in place? What accuracy? Who has access to it? How, uh, who, who could use it for a civil process in other cases? Uh, we don't see that it really solves any problems. But they, they did make recommendations along those lines. So there are two parallel. We, they are um, temporary appointed by the president. We are permanent, uh, nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate. Um, but we actually let them use our office space. Uh, and um, you know, one of them was my law professor <laughs> in law school. Another is a good friend of mine, and so you know we we inter we kept our, our sort of our analysis and our views separate, um, but we but we were sort of around at the same time. But but that, that people often wonder about the relationship between the two. I should also add that they proposed uh, that we be abolished, which we didn't take too personally, uh, and then and that that, that we be that a substitute organ of the entity be created called the Civil Liberties and Privacy Protection Board. Uh, we strongly oppose that name, which could be. Uh, called clipboard. Uh, um, and we also disagree with the idea that, if we, that it took us about five years to get reestablished as a board. And if we were abolished, especially with a presidential election coming up, we're not likely to be recreated anytime soon. Um, so uh, we have differing views about whether we would uh, agree with the expansion of authority that they recommended. But I think the idea of abolishing us um, doesn't make sense, because then we'll just go without a, any oversight for, for several years. Um, but we, we certainly have engaged with them quite a bit. Um, just going back to the reforms to the court, um, they actually recommended, I believe, an entity, a permanent entity, be created. Um, we were, we didn't, we didn't find that very satisfactory because we didn't think that the uh, special advocate should be in the executive branch because it's the executive branch that's going to the court, um, and then we don't think it should be the judicial judicial branch because they need to be the independent deciders of these issues, and and you typically don't have the legislative branch recommended. So we didn't we didn't think having a permit. Also, these these issues don't come up that often, and we don't want someone who's sitting there day by day, not knowing what to do, and start sticking their nose into other things. And so we thought the best way to do it is to have private lawyers come in. If you need, if you have a bunch of cases all at once, you could have two or three private lawyers. If you have nothing going on, private lawyers don't get called in. And we thought that was the best way to to handle the approach. We also recommended that there be an appellate process. Right now, there is a foreign intelligence surveillance court of review, Fisker, that's hold that heard two cases ever. Because uh, the government doesn't usually appeal these decisions, uh, and so we thought it was important that the special advocate uh, be able to bring to the attention of the Fisker um, cases so that so that uh, they could be heard in an appellate situation. Um, it's a little bit tricky with standing and issues and other constitutional constitutional issues, but I think we've recommended an approach that would allow the cases to go up. I should also mention that one of our fellow our board members is a former federal appellate judge who believes strongly in the value of appellate review. Um, and so that certainly informed our decision about how important it was to have the Fisker be involved and ultimately have the chance to go to the United States Supreme Court on, on these cases as well. I'm sorry? Um, no, these, the, the, there, is a, there is an appellate court uh, that oversees the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court of Review, which was, <coughs> if, it's also, the, for, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court is made of Article III judges who are assigned by the Chief Justice to serve for, for periods of time on the FISC. Uh, and they're also judges assigned by the Chief Justice to serve on the Court of Review. So these are our Article III judges coming in to serve this, this special function for, for periods of time. And then they have terms and they, and they rotate out. Um, but, but again, so we thought that type of review was, was, a, was a very important. Um, 
We also think it's important, uh, I guess, turning to the last part of our uh, report um, on transparency, um, that there, I think one of the things we've learned over the last months post Snowden uh, is that uh, in a democracy, it's important that people be comfortable, the people be comfortable with the authorities that the government undertakes to conduct surveillance. Um, and, that, and so we advocated a number of um, efforts to be more transparent about this process, and all but one of these recommendations were unanimous on our board. Uh, we recommended that the decisions of the court going forward be declassified on a routine basis uh, if they involve significant issues so people can evaluate what the court's doing. Um, we advocated that the court go back and declassify old decisions, which is a little bit harder because they weren't written with the view to be declassified, um, but to, to uh, declassify those. We, said we recommend the government be more transparent about the number of requests and kind of requests it makes to companies. Um, and we also recommended that companies be given greater leeway um, <coughs> consistent with national security uh, to disclose government requests. And as you may know, a couple weeks ago, there was an agreement between the tech companies and the Justice Department to allow for greater transparency along those lines. Um, the one area in transparency that we disagreed is that the majority of the board felt that there should be no secret laws, that is laws where it's not apparent from the face of the law um, that the government had a certain authority. Um, and Professor Granick and I were talking earlier that the 702 program um, I think people understood in broad brush, at least there have been some aspects of it you may not have, but broad brush what the 702 program was about from reading the statute. The same wasn't true with the 215 program. And, and, and you can have debates and discussions, but it's important in a democracy that we at least authorize the programs, even if you don't reveal the details of the programs, the sources of methods, um, at least the broad authority being granted to the government. Um, that, again, the minority disagreed with that and felt that didn't necessarily have to be the case, but our majority felt that that was an important part of the democratic process. Um, so um, that's pretty much the scope of our 215 report that was issued on January 23rd. Uh, we've now turned to um, 702, um, which is the program for collecting the contents of communications, both email and telephone calls, um, uh, targeted at non-U.S. persons overseas. Uh, and we will be holding a public workshop on March 19th to hear from the government, from advocates, from academics, um, on, the, on the number of issues that are raised by this program, <coughs> including whether how non-U.S. persons should be treated, both as a legal and policy matter uh, under our law. Um, there's an about process where we collect information not only targeted at particular persons, but about those persons and whether that um, is, is authorized and, and appropriate, um, and also access to information about U.S. persons that happens to be collected as part of this process, and under what circumstances should the government be able to look at that information for purposes unrelated, for instance, to counterterrorism, maybe criminal investigations. Um, and so we, we have drawn conclusions about these issues, but we're going to take testimony and think about that as part of our report. We hope to get our report out uh, late spring, early summer, um, and address, again, the legal, constitutional, and policy issues relating to that program. And after that, we'll turn to other things, given staff resources, um, but things that we might look at are the National Counterterrorism Center's operations, use of drones to target Americans, um, training programs, um, and um, uh, who knows what. Um, that, that, that'll probably be start later in the spring and the summer. Um, but with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes, this is uh, maybe a too personal a question, but you, like, like you, I had to get a top level clearance. And I remember part of what you had to do was to give up access to your medical records, to your financial records. You had to give the FBI permission to contact your neighbors, see if you were a drunkard or something, or if you had other behavior problems. You had to state if you had any overseas connections to people, relatives or friends and so on. So assuming you had to do everything I had to do, how do you feel about the fact that the government knows so much about you personally? Well, uh, uh, I think it's a great question, but I'll, I'll even take it back before that, which is that uh, before getting security clearance, um, you have to be nominated in, in my job for the, by the President of the United States. And, and the background vetting on that is unbelievably intrusive. And I have to say, it does not encourage public service um, to have to go through that. But not only do you have to give up information about your financial records and your medical records uh, and so forth, but you undergo an interview process where you're asked about any extramarital relationships you may have, drug use, uh, um, associations, um, and it's extraordinarily invasive. Um, so the security clearance, in my case, 
what happened was, um, uh, uh, because I'd gone through that FBI background check in 2011 for my nomination, when I started the job, again, four days before Snowden and needed to be briefed right away, uh, I, I said I needed a, a clearance on Friday of, the, of that week, and by Monday I had a temporary clearance, and Tuesday I had a permanent without having done anything extra um, because they'd already done the background check on me. Um, but it, uh, how do I feel about it? Uh, you know, I'm being entrusted with enormously sensitive, the most sensitive secrets the country has, um, and also serving as an appointed official, and I, I guess I view that as a, a, the price one pays for having getting that element of trust. Um, so I've, I've sort of given up on my personal privacy. Um, Um, well, that, that's actually a central issue that we looked at in the 215 telephony metadata program, um, and, and in, some, in some ways it, it shows the distinction between the views of the, our majority and our minority. Um, the majority view is that collection is also important, um, uh, because if, if you know that all of your phone records are being collected, even if no human being is looking at them and maybe only a computer, um, if you're a source for journalists, you may not want to call that journalist knowing that the government now has a record of that phone call. If you're a dissident um, and you want to organize against the war or against the president or against uh, some activity, and you know now the government is, is seeing all those connections, if you're a religious organization, um, there are lots of, of ways in which you might be chilled in exercising your right of association, your right of free speech, your right of religion, just knowing that the government um, has that information. Also, um, for those of us who remember the Watergate era, uh, and, and J. Edgar Hoover's surveillance of Martin Luther King Jr. and others, uh, I think we've, we've become used to a somewhat beneficent government uh, this century, um, but I think you only have to look back to the last century to see the abuses that the people in power can, can make of government information. And so what, I think we have to think long term about collecting that much sensitive information, particularly when we concluded it was not all that valuable. Um, and, then, and, and also, right now, it's telephone records the same principle could apply to um, credit card records or financial transactions um, or location information. And so if we have the government now collecting information about uh, who you talk to, where you go, where you spend your money, uh, it does change the balance of power between the citizens and the government um, in a way that I think it discourages privacy and civil liberties. Um, and so I, I think, in my view, and a majority view of our board, the mere collection of information has significant consequences. But I, but I also certainly agree that use is also a critical constraint. And, and, and I hope the information I provided for my background check and, and vetting and security claims will not be used for purposes unrelated to that. Um, so I think they're both important concepts. But I think in particular in, in the 215 program, collection uh, is, a, is a very significant factor. Thanks for coming here. And um, my question, before I ask a question, I have a comment. I happened to watch a video um, of Mr. Greenbond on ESPN on December 18th, uh, in which he was talking about the whole program and reporting to the European Commission. And he said the only purpose of this program is to harass people. Um, I also saw another article, I brought it for you. Uh, it's by a person called Alfred McCoy, Title is Surveillance and Scandal. He's a professor at University of Wisconsin. And he talks about very bad things, which I don't want to repeat. The question I have for you is, these are all Americans. These are not terrorist people. They're not born and raised and educated in those countries who are our enemies. They are, nor, you know, in normal circumstances, would be called reasonably respected people. The question I have is why is there such a massive <laughs> dichotomy, <coughs> contradiction between what these people are saying and what the government is saying? And second thing that I want to ask you, in your you know, deliberations and your investigations and in trying to find the truth and level with the American people, have you had the chance to talk to people who are outside the government um, 
for instance, I may have had some experience and I might want to share with you. Did you get a chance to talk to those people? And the point I really want to make to you is it is not the surveillance that people are bothered about. It is not the fact that government is looking at the data that people are bothered about. What is really bothering people is, is that information being used for abuse of power? And are you in a position to investigate that, to find that out, that it is not being used by the cronies and people who are in the you know, powerful positions, their affiliates? I'm not anti-Obama. I voted for the president. I support the president as the first president of the United States of America, of a person of color. But I'm also myself in a situation, I believe it is important that all people have a right to know what is going on. Thank you. Um, I'll try to address all those. If I, if I leave something out, um, let me know. First, let me start off by saying that um, our board unanimously feels, based on all of our work and interactions with the intelligence community, um, that, that we found nothing but good faith efforts by the employees of the intelligence community to protect the country and to respect our, our liberties. Uh, we found no instances at all of intentional misuse. There, were, there, were, there have been some compliance efforts that I think have been largely unintentional, but no, no efforts to abuse the information that they've had access to. As I mentioned just a few minutes ago, uh, I'm more concerned about the potential for abuse than, than, and it's really not what we found. We found extraordinarily dedicated people um, who, who worry more than any of you, uh, it's their job to, about something they might have missed uh, that could cause a calamity. And so, so they take their jobs very seriously, and, and I really respect uh, the hard work that they put in. Um, in terms of the program, uh, I don't um, join the critiques that were made. Uh, I do think the program had it, it was well intentioned. And I think that as a logical matter, you might say it, it should have worked better than it actually did. Uh, but I guess I would keep in mind uh, two things. One is, um, as we've seen over the last couple of years, there's been a, a growth in domestic terrorism. Um, and so to say, why would we collect domestic information uh, I think there is a reason, which is we have, have domestic terrorists. And so I, I, would, I, don't, I wouldn't preclude that from being, again, it, our, my view is that there should be particularized searches rather than bulk collection. But I don't think you would say, just because someone is American, uh, as we know, unfortunately, all too well, that they're not engaged, they're capable of engaging in terrorist activity. Um, the other thing is that uh, offshore terrorists can, as we know from 9-11, communicate with either their colleagues who they've infiltrated into the country um, or potentially to American sympathizers. Um, and so I think there is a, a, a relevance um, to gathering telephone connections from overseas into the United States as well. So I, I, think, that, I think the program had a legitimate basis. Uh, as I say, um, we, would, we would move it back to the providers and, and have it on a case-by-case -case basis. But I don't, I, don't think, I don't think it's motivated, uh, and I don't think there's any evidence it was used purely for improper um, surveillance purposes. Um, we've talked to whoever wants to talk to us. Um, we held two public events, and we also created a public record where individuals or organizations could submit comments. We're doing the same thing, um, starting with our 702 report, and we received dozens of comments from both individuals and organizations. I personally read every single one of them. Um, and so we, we certainly have tried to reach out. We've also tried to get uh, sort of a 360-degree view of these programs. We've met with the government officials um, who operate the program. We've met with the um, providers um, who provide information to the government. And we've also met with the recipients of the government requests, the companies that have to respond. Um, so we've tried to look at it from, from all sides as, as best we could. Um, so I don't know if I answered all your questions. How are you able to assess the value or lack thereof of the information being collected? What's the methodology? We, uh, the government, um, as you know, asserted uh, that there were a dozen cases in which the 215 program was critical um, uh, to those cases. And so what we did is we took a close look at those dozen um, instances. We went to the intelligence community and said we would like classified information that describes in greater detail than the public accounts of why those programs were examples of the success of the 215 program. And we received, we had discussions with the government uh, on those programs in some detail, and we also received classified documents 
um, in support of the success of those programs. Um, we then wrote up a factual description from our perspective of how each of those instances occurred and what happened and the role that the 215 program played. And we provided our factual write-up to the government, to the intelligence community, and said, please let us know if we factually got this right or not. Uh, and they, they came back and said, largely, you did. There were a few facts here and there which we incorporated. I should just say that as a quick aside, we did the same thing with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, is we did a write-up of its operations, and we asked the court to court staff to make sure we got it right. And, and again, accept, and their feedback was very valuable. So, so after we did all that to make sure we, our factual basis was correct, we conducted our own analysis and decided that there were, I believe it's seven criteria that we applied to how successful the program was. Um, uh, the sort of the headline uh, is both our report and the review group report was that it hadn't thwarted any terrorist plot, which is true. Um, but we did, that, was, that was our starting point, not our ending point. We also looked at uh, how it might have been helpful in finding co-conspirators, um, how it might be helpful in the peace of mind notion, which is that if there's a terrorist plot that we discover offshore, is there any U.S. connection? Because if there's a U.S. connection, we've got to deploy the FBI to figure out what's going on, and that consumes resources that they could be spending doing other things, and it can be important to know that there isn't a U.S. connection so that our resources could be deployed elsewhere. We considered that as a factor. Um, we also looked at uh, uh, the one case where there was a success, which was a material support case where uh, the, the person who was the target of the investigation provided financial support to an offshore terrorist organization. They didn't engage in a terrorist act themselves, but they provided support, which is you know a crime and it's an important thing to investigate. Uh, but when we, when we added all that up, what we concluded was that the program had limited success to date and that the government has already other tools available to it to gather substantially the same information. And that given the significant privacy and civil liberties concerns of, race, of collecting bulk data, um, our view was you should eliminate the bulk data program and use those other government resources, as I mentioned, search warrants, grand jury subpoenas, national security letters, to access that information on a particularized basis, um, and, 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 which in some extent they'd already been doing, um, and believe that they would be substantially effective in the same way. Um, the 215 program is a, was essentially a reactive program, which is the government had to have a phone number that they were interested in, um, and, a, and, and they had to develop a reasonable, articulable suspicion that that number was associated with an investigation of terrorism, and then search that number. Um, and so the, so the leads came from, come from elsewhere, and then the, and the 215 database was being used to follow up on, on the leads that came from elsewhere. It, one of the sorry, one of the few of the recommendations of the other report that was rejected out of hand preemptively by the White House was splitting NSA's director from head of kind of defensive measures and cyber command because there's just seems an inherent conflict of interest if you're trying to maximize the use of exploits to also be working to protect privacy and against surveillance. Did your group look at that? Should there be a split between uh, kind of the offensive weapons and the defensive uh, capabilities? Um, we didn't. Again, uh, the review group's scope was sort of across the whole intelligence arena. Um, our focus was on the 215 and 702 program, and so we just did not look at that issue at all. Our mandate is uh, federal counterterrorism efforts, by the, uh, and so I, uh, I have to say I haven't really focused on that issue as to how much that impacts federal counterterrorism efforts uh, to the extent that they impact privacy and civil liberties. Um, um, so I just, it's just not an issue that honestly that we've thought about. I know I know they re the review group recommended it. The White House immediately rejected that recommendation, uh, but it's not something that we've addressed one way or the other. Thanks for being here today. I want to say the, your report on 215 I thought was pretty remarkable, so I say thanks for that. Um, I have a sort of process question uh, about how you dealt with the classification and then release of the actual document. Um, the reason I think that's important is because the kind of perennial problem with intelligence oversight is secrecy. So even if we think the oversight is good, it takes place in secret and we never see it. So how did you guys actually clear the document? Did you have to get someone to sign off uh, were you concerned about the classification of the material in there? 
Um, first, thanks for your comments on the 250 report. And I do think it, uh, it's um, the most in-depth uh, study of the 215 program, the most in-depth description, legal analysis, constitutional analysis, and policy analysis. You may not agree with where we came out, but, but I don't think anyone has looked at it in, in quite as much depth. Um, in terms of classification, I guess for starters, we were, uh, our job was somewhat easier than it might otherwise have been uh, because of the substantial amount of declassification of information relating to the 215 program that's occurred. Uh, but we, um, we actually have um, two computer systems uh, in our office. We have an unclassified uh, uh, email and phone, um, and we have a classified computer and phone. Uh, and so to the extent that we, uh, parts of the report were potentially classified or were classified, it was written on what we call the high side, which is the classified side, and then we did the rest of the report on the low side. Um, when it came time to actually pr to finalize our report, um, we underwent a classification review where the intelligence community reviewed the draft of our report, not for you know, uh, tone or conclusions, um, but literally whether uh, it contained classified information or not. Um, uh, and, and ultimately, what happened in that process is that um, they, had, they did raise a few concerns about some of the language or, or facts in the report, and we ultimately felt, um, after discussion with them, that we could make minor changes to the report that didn't affect the substance of our analysis or recommendations um, and do the entire report um, in an um, unclassified form. Uh, we uh, reserved the ability, uh, essentially the right to seek declassification uh, of materials, which again, we never felt we needed to do in the 215 report context, again, because there's so much out there. Um, and also reserved the ability to have a classified appendix that would go to the President and Congress um, to discuss aspects of the program that, that should remain classified. Uh, but again, we didn't feel the need to do that. Uh, we're going to face a much more challenging set of questions as we move into the 702 program, uh, where much of it remains classified. Um, and our, our goal is to be as transparent as possible and to try to explain the program, because there's been a lot of misinformation about how the program operates, to explain it as clearly as we can in an unclassified setting. And there will be an unclassified report, uh, but I can't say at this point as to whether we may feel the need to have a classified appendix, uh, again, to the President and Congress uh, to accompany it, and also uh, to push back uh, and, and make the case that some of the things that are classified shouldn't be classified and are important to the public debate. And, and um, I can assure you we'll zealously advance that cause if we feel it's necessary to tell the full story. I would think that if I had been exposed to all the data that you have, I would be an ideal terrorist kidnap target. <laughs> so uh, what is the situation there? <laughs> well, I guess I won't be getting a good night's sleep tonight. <laughs> uh, um, I, I, I can uh, say with a high degree of confidence there are a lot more people in the U.S. government who know more than I do uh, about uh, classified information. Um, so I'll, um, but I, I don't plan on revealing any government secrets if I'm uh, captured. Well, I, I mean, I think it's obviously these are important issues. I mean, there are a lot of bad guys out there, and I think it's important that we maintain our capability um, to uh, successfully um, handle the potential terrorist attacks. Um, but I, I, as I say, I, I think that I would, people they could do a lot better than picking me. Um, uh, but uh, and hopefully, hopefully they won't be picking off anybody. So one of the um, big issues that we've been trying to find out for a long time is how these programs affect American privacy. And Congress has repeatedly asked representatives from the intelligence agencies how many American communications, how many Americans, how much data about Americans has been swept up in these programs which are ostensibly targeting others. And the intelligence community has continually refused to answer that question. Um, in fact, they say they haven't counted. So how can, in making the assessment about whether these programs and how they affect American privacy, how can the PCLOB get a sense of those numbers and the extent of that effect if NSA has, if that, it's true that NSA has not and will not count? Well. I think we can get a sense of the impact on Americans from the scope of the programs, even if we don't have the precise numbers. I mean, uh, we know that hundreds of millions of phone records are gathered as part of the 215 program, even if we don't necessarily know how many Americans' phone records were, were gathered. In the 702 program, likewise, um, 
there, there's a, the potential, um, as we know, for gathering communications where an American is, is a party, at least one party to that communication. Um, it's, not, it's not a potential. That's the purpose of the program, right? Purpose the purpose of the program is to target non-U.S. persons outside the United States. Yeah, clearly, but, it's not, it, it, it can be anticipated that some of those conversations or email correspondence will be with Americans. Um, I guess I'm not persuaded that, that quantifying the exact number of Americans is critical to our evaluation of the balance of privacy and civil liberties. Uh, and the other thing is, um, and, and this will be an issue in the 702 program, um, it's not always easy to tell uh, from an email communication or a telephone communication who is an American and not. I, th I think that you know, one of the things we'll obviously be examining is how that determination is made. Um, but we, we, you know, I can get a cell phone number from, in, from the UK. Um, and someone from the UK can get an uh, area code 202 phone number. Um, uh, they can spoof IP addresses. Uh, you know, there, it's, not always, it's not always a simple undertaking to determine who someone is and where they are. Uh, and again, that's very much a challenge to the program. It's also a challenge for the government. Uh, and some, some would argue, um, and I think with some force, um, that if you want the government to undergo that exercise, that may actually be more privacy invasive than not doing that. Because in order to make that determination, then we have to investigate more, de the government has to investigate in more detail each of these individuals and gather more information about them just for making that Americanness determination. So again, I, I think it's important, in my, in my view, it's important to know in general terms the, the numbers that are being collected rather than the specific numbers. But I know that request has been made by Congress and others of the intelligence community, um, and, and they haven't complied with it as yet. Yeah, as even just for an order of magnitude. I wonder whether the criminal referrals are a key to getting kind of a sense of it. You know, if you have from the, you know, if you have X number of criminal referrals or criminal investigations sparked as a result of something collected under 702, and, you know, Y percentage of those are Americans, then that may give you some sense of overall how, what percentage of Americans' communications are caught in the database. Um, I, don't, I don't, I'm going to say something, I'm not sure this is the right approach because we're still getting into it, but the 702 program covers a lot more information than just criminal referrals. And so I'm not sure that that would give you the full picture uh, of, of the program's operation. Mm -hmm. um, it may be a metric. Uh, I wouldn't rule it out. Um, and, and also, it depends if those Americans are co-conspirators with, you know, uh, international terrorists, that may be an issue as well. So it's certainly, I mean, I wouldn't reject it as a metric. I just, I think it's, my guess is it's more complex than just that number itself. And then my, my second question is, um, we've had a number of the um, internet companies and increasingly telephone companies issuing transparency reports which say how many <laughs> orders they've received. Um, but the transparency reports don't make sense in light of what we already know about the records that the companies are turning over. So for example, um, AT&T's transparency report did not indicate that every single one of its customers had information disclosed to the government. And I'm, I wonder, since um, we agree that transparency is so important, and those were recommendations you made in 215. How does the practical reality of what we're seeing in transparency reports, why is it failing, um, and how can we fix that? Um, I think it's a good question. We did, the, as I said before, recommend that companies be consistent with national security, be able to disclose more information. We Truthfully, the um, Justice Department agreement with companies was just recently entered into, and we haven't had a chance to evaluate how effective it's been in terms of, of what can be disclosed. Um, so I think, I think it's an important consideration. Um, I, but I also wouldn't minimize the national security part of that equation, which is that revealing numbers um, under some circumstances can have national security consequences because it can reveal which, which are some of our sources of information. Um, so I think, that, I think there is a balance there. But I think, as I say, it was one of our recommendations. And we just, in the, in the ensuing weeks, as we've turned to the 702 program, haven't also had a chance to go back and evaluate how this transparency is working. We have talked a little bit to the companies who, not surprisingly, think it's pretty good and could be better in terms of their ability to make these disclosures. 
But just as another example, in the 702 context, we've, the companies have begun to disclose within ranges right. what kind of national security orders or requests they've received. And if you add up the ranges, even at the high end, it's less than 10,000 from Google and Yahoo and I think Microsoft who've released their numbers so far. But we know from the declassified FISA court opinion that the government's collecting 250 million <coughs> communications a year under 702. So you have less than 10,000, but 250 million. There's something going wrong there. Yeah, I give one something we'll have to take a look at. First of all, thanks for all the details. I don't even understand all the things you're talking about. But two things I want to mention to you. The nation has been at war for a long time. Um, bad accident, you know, um, Terrorism has happened. 9-11 is fresh in the minds of all of us. So to expect that government would stop protecting Amer Americans is not a very good idea. Or that it should stop collecting data is also not a very good idea. On top of it, private companies are ex collecting so much more information that government not collecting is actually at a dis can be at a disadvantage in certain situations. But what I am saying, though, is, and, and the second point, that there is a massive amount of outflow from, from the government into the private sector at the highest levels. People with immense power and connections who can pull strings, who can do things um, that can amount to an abuse of power. So I believe as a strategy, I suggest to you, that it is a great idea to focus not on the collection of information, but on the abuse of power and how to stop that and where it happens. I totally believe that people who are serving in the intelligence agencies and law enforcement are great people, honorable people. You look at a movie like Lone Survivor. These are the people who go with the you know, uh, tenets of um, you know, valor and integrity. But I'm not sure this integrity goes all the way and everywhere. Again, as I said, we, we, we don't think more information should be collected than is necessary um, uh, to it. I mean, and another issue, by the way, just uh, a going forward challenge that we're just beginning to get involved in is cybersecurity, um, where um, there's, there's information flow between the private sector and the government because the government wants to help prevent cyber attacks um, and information has to be shared with the government. We're actually under the president's executive order um, charged with uh, uh, consulting with the Department of Homeland Security, uh, which we're doing right now, uh, on how to strike that balance between sharing information with the government, having the government share information back with the private sector, but still protect privacy and civil liberties at the same time. Um, and that's something, that's, a, that's an information flow that I think is going to become greater, uh, ho in some ways hopefully, because uh, we need to pay more attention to the threat posed by cyber attacks. And, and, and there has to be an information flow, but also customers and companies have to be confident that governments can use the information responsibly. So we've had two judges at least come down, I guess maybe now there's been three, with different positions on whether 215 violates the Fourth Amendment. And I read the, the redacted version of Kohler Cotley's, Kohler Cotley's decision, where she said it doesn't because it was, un, I mean, paraphrasing, at least how I read it, that it was unreasonable to expect privacy which struck me as a catch-22 argument by, you know, I mean, it's like, um, to me, I'm not, I'm an economist, not a lawyer, it seems like a blatant violation of the Fourth Amendment, and I agreed with the judge that found that. Um, did your review look at that question, as, and did it come to a decision? Um, we looked at it in uh, incredible depth, um, and, and here's uh, the sh sort of short of it, which is, uh, Decades ago, um, the Supreme Court decided a case called Smith v. Maryland, uh, which was one suspected criminal in Baltimore uh, who had been identified as potentially harassing a woman, um, and the government asked for permission. I mean, actually, the government didn't ask. The government went and got a pen trap, which they, registered, they recorded in a very rudimentary way the calls that were made. They didn't even know if they connected, and they had a lot less information on one person for a limited period of time when they were suspected of a, of a crime. Um, and then the person was found to be calling this woman and, and was ultimately convicted. And he appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. 
and said, I sh on the Fourth Amendment, I was entitled to have a warrant before the government collected that information. And the court said, no, your information went to the phone company. And because you gave it to the phone company, you no longer had an expectation of privacy because it went to a third party. And so the Supreme Court in that said, said therefore, um, the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply in that case. Um, the government has since built uh, the NSA program, which was not one person, but you know, hundreds of millions of people, and not just for a short period of time, but all of their collection of information, and not just a limited amount of information, a lot of information on this program. And Judge Leon, who's one of the judges um, who's ruled on this, said, you know, whether you distinguish it or overrule it, Smith v. Maryland no longer applies to that, to that situation. We actually, I, I happen to um, have been a colleague, former colleague of the person who argued for Maryland in Smith v. Maryland. We had him come in to talk to our staff about his Supreme Court argument, brought his notes in, and he can't believe that his little case has served as the basis for this massive program. He doesn't want his legacy um, to be having supported, he's a former Attorney General of Maryland, that, um, to uh, support this program. Uh, but that's, uh, and so the unanim our board unanimously said Smith v. Maryland is the law of the land. Um, and until the Supreme Court reverses it or distinguishes it, um, the government was reasonable in relying on that case. But our, also, our board, also, the majority of our board also said, we see the trend going in the other direction. Um, the Jones case, which people can debate, which is the GPS case, some people view the tea leaves of Justice Alito and Sotomayor's concurring opinions as suggesting this court might reevaluate third party doctrine. Some people disagree. But the majority of our board felt that the trend of the law was moving in that direction. And that even if the constitutional issues don't change, we thought as a policy matter, um, the privacy and civil liberties issues dictated that this program be discontinued. Um, but we'll, I, I think what we'll, we may find is this case works its way up to the Supreme Court. We do have two district judges uh, on the constitutional issue differing with each other, whether they, then it'll go to the Court of Appeals, and if there's ultimately a split, maybe it'll go to the Supreme Court. But also, since there are statutory issues and the court likes to avoid constitutional questions, the court could decide it on statutory grounds. So, it may be some time before the Supreme Court rules. Uh, yeah, I think it would be very helpful for the Supreme Court to, to weigh in on this. OK, so S Smith v. Maryland says you've given your data to a third party, the phone company, so you no warrant is necessary. Why then have FISA courts? Why have all this um, existing infrastructure to establish or gather warrants in private, in secret? Why even bother if it's not necessary? Well, um, even if it's not necessary as a constitutional matter to get a warrant, Congress did create the structure of the FISA court to have judicial oversight uh, over this process and, and to approve these cases. Um, as I said, our other one of our other recommendations is to make that a more um, robust review process by having a special advocate come in. Uh, I mean, one of the things that our report revealed is there had never been a FISA court opinion analyzing the issues raised by the 215 program until 2013, even though the program had started in 2006. Not to, have to say the judges didn't think about it, but, but part of when you have a, a litigated case, the judge then ultimately has to write a thoughtful opinion and defend the judge's analysis and position that was never done with the 215 program. Uh, and so in, in some ways, uh, I, uh, I think it's imp important that to have judges rule on these things and then have a uh, appellate body review, review and ultimately the Supreme Court. Um, but, but again, Congress added some protections essentially either separate from or beyond the Fourth Amendment in this case, and I think that was valuable to, to have a court approve these orders. And thanking David Medin for coming here and talking to us today. Thank, David, thank you. This has been great. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.